So let's restart the class. So the next part is uh, politically sensitive products. So if our company is making a product, it could be politically sensitive. We have to see is it politically sensitive or not. Does our product have an effect on the environment? Exchange rates, national security. Uh, <clears throat> some in the US, for example, they won't allow a foreign company to own their telephone operation lines, have a telephone license, right? For national security reason, the US government wants to be able to check people's telephone calls or telephone records. So they won't allow a foreign company to own the telephone company in the US, right? Uh, so we could have public debate about our type of product. Often health, products which have felt health or health issues. Uh, we can see that if we just look at cigarettes, it's a very different policy all around the world. In some countries, the packaging of the cigarette has to be showing some pictures of the lungs or some very horrible pictures, right? In other countries, you can have cigarette advertising on the TV, right? So some very different ideas in, in countries about this kind of product. Uh, <coughs> European Union has banned hormone-treated beef. So we talked about the difference between the US and the EU before for genetically treated or hormone-treated products. Hormones means giving some hormone makes the uh, beef, the cow, grow more quickly, grow bigger. Right? So they use, no problem with that in the US, but in Europe, it's banned. <clears throat> so we can get political risk insurance. So how can we deal with political risk? One way we can do that is insurance. We can call the insurance company and they will, if we have a political problem, they will pay us money. But not many companies use this because it's expensive and hard to measure. Because it's hard to measure, then it's going to be expensive, right? The company can't really measure exactly, so they're going to make the premium more expensive than it should be. Uh, but what kind of things do they provide protection against? Contract repudiation. So we made a contract with the government, okay? But the government says, sorry, I don't want to contract anymore, or they break the contract, they don't follow the contract, okay? Um, there was a case in an uh, Eastern European country where the government made a contract with a company. The company said that they would provide electricity, private electricity company, okay? And the government said that they would help them to get paid their bill. Right? Because the company was afraid that the industries wouldn't pay the bill. So, what happened was the company entered and everything was going well. They were selling electricity. Then some large companies stopped paying the electricity bills. So the electricity company wanted to cut their electricity. But the government didn't allow them to cut the electricity. Okay? So they couldn't. They couldn't cut the electricity. So they were providing free electricity in the end to the company, right? So the government kind of broke the contract. Is there anything the company can do if the government breaks the contract or kind of breaks the contract? It's hard, right? They have to try and make some international dispute resolution. We'll talk about later in the legal area, okay? But this is kind of political risk and the, you can get paid for the insurance company. Any other negative government actions? They discriminate you in, against you in tax. They suddenly change the tax against you. They make a non-tariff barrier we talked about suddenly. Your payment is delayed. Those kind of things. Uh, your executives are kidnapped. Where might your, where would you be afraid of being kidnapped? Where do kidnappings happen? Airplane. Hmm? Plane. Huh? Airplane. Airplane. Airplanes? Do you understand kidnapping? Um, yes? Yes. yes? Yes. There was a kidnapping in my class last week. 
you understand the joke? Yeah. Ah, ah. Napping also means sleeping in English. Yes. And kid means like... Ah, yeah. Yeah. There was a kid napping in my class last week. You were supposed to say, Really? Oh no! And then I'll say, No, just I meant sleeping. Right. Okay, so anyway, kidnapping doesn't mean somebody sleeping. It means uh, that <coughs> they take you. Uh, have you seen Taken? The movie? Taken? They take you and then they ask your parents or somebody to pay money. In this case, it's the company. They kidnap somebody from the company and they ask the company, pay one million dollars or we're going to kill this person. Where, where might that happen these days? What country? Afghanistan. Afghanistan, we saw on the internet, right? Kidnap some Japanese and British and American people. And they ask their company or their government to pay a lot of money or they could kill them, right? In Nigeria, we can also see kidnappings. In Colombia and South America, we also saw kidnappings before, right? So what should a company do? What would you do if they kidnap your worker? Say, oh, that's okay. Don't worry, he's not an important worker. <laughs> we can hire somebody else. Like that? Hmm? Are you going to pay the ransom? There's a movie with Russell Crowe, where he's an agent not working for the police, and there was a kidnapping in South America, and his job is to negotiate for the company to pay money and save the person. So we can get insurance against that. Strikes. Uh, lacks of enforcement of copyright agreements. Government interferes. Bribery. We lose a contract because the government accepted bribery from somebody else. Can also, that's a political risk, right? I want to make a metro station in Africa, build a metro, billion dollar contract, but another company bribes them first. Then I lose the contract, but I already spent millions of dollars preparing. So I can get insurance against that, if, if I can prove it was bribery. So other ways, if we don't buy insurance, which is expensive, there's other ways that we can make the risk less. One way is to make a good relationship with the government. Okay, that's an easier way. Make a good relationship with the government. Do politicians and governments like multinational companies or don't like multinational companies? What do you think, generally? If you're a politician in your local town and a multinational company, Microsoft, says, I want to come there and start a new company, are you going to be happy or not happy? Happy, happy right? Normally there it's good news. The company creates jobs, creates employment. The workers pay taxes. We can use those taxes for social services. Okay? So companies have to use this kind of uh, argument with the politician. One reason that they might not like them is that they might put the local company out of business or local suppliers. So we can promise to use locally produced resources. Okay? We help the country by increasing their exports. We transfer money, technologies and skills. We create jobs if we're in the company. We make tax contributions. Okay? Sometimes the politician, in order to get elected, they will focus public opinion on the negative part of the MNCs, like environmental damage or taking away local business, that kind of thing. But that's kind of just to get elected, right? One Irish politician, do you know WikiLeaks? One Irish politician was caught on WikiLeaks because he had a conversation with the US ambassador. And the US ambassador asked him about the policy. He said, uh, it looks like uh, you're telling the people uh, to vote no on this treaty, some treaty in Europe, right? And the politician said, oh, I just need to tell that to the people. But don't worry, that's not what I really think. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to make sure the vote is the other way. Even though I said that publicly, I didn't mean it. Don't worry, right? He was trying to calm down the US ambassador. So we can see that that guy was caught. He was quite embarrassed when the WikiLeaks came out. The politician, he lost his, since he lost his job, as the, he was the leader of a political party, right? So 
Sometimes the political parties can try to blame the MNC in public to, for their own interest or their own idea. So, uh, other ways we can do, apart from making a good relationship with the government, we can make a joint venture. Do you understand a joint venture? You, you do or you don't? No? So we have company A and company B. We have three options. First, option one, we can merger. Merger is we can make AB. Okay? New company. This is like Chrysler Benz, right? And Dime, uh, sorry, uh, Daimler Chrysler US company and Mercedes Benz, a Germany company, came together to make a new company, right? Chrysler Benz, half the name of each company. That's a merger, they're equal. Number two, we can have an acquisition. A, we just have A, right? A just buys B. Okay, acquisition, like Microsoft buys a smaller company. They become part of Microsoft. Number three, we can have a joint venture. We have A, we have B, they come together to make a new company. C, okay? McDonald's, when they went to India, McDonald's used a joint venture. Why? They wanted to lessen their political risk and economic risk. Why? Indian people didn't like US companies, right? Because India is very uh, kind of anti, so they have a lot of anti-American feeling or because they used to be uh, a UK colony. So they don't like the idea of the powerful uh, empire sort of thing, right? So they, they don't like American products, so the government officials also could be negative to the American company. So McDonald's said, why don't we join with the Indian company? 50-50, make a new company, C, McDonald's India. Okay? Then what will happen? We have a problem with a politician. Politician says, for example, they can decide planning permission. Do you understand planning permission? Planning permission is when I want to start a new business, I need to get permission to start the business. Yes. Right? I can't just start a business in a town, I need permission. Politicians are going to decide that. Okay? So, they thought if we have the Indian company there, they can help us to talk to the politicians, right? Convince the politicians, convince the local community that it's a good idea. So many companies decide to do joint ventures. In Ch entering China, many companies decide to do joint ventures too, right? Also, the joint venture can help with the language issues. Okay, a lot, joint venture can help with a lot of issues. But one of them, an important one, is we can have cultural issues, but also the political issues. They can make better relationship with the local politicians than we can, okay? So, Joint venture is one way. Expanding the investment base, uh, making more foreign investors to come into our company. Licensing. Do you understand the licensing? Can you give me an example of licensing? Follow company's name. Following company's name. So you sell your company's name and intellectual products, yeah. property. Especially small companies, licensing is quite useful. Imagine that I'm a pharmaceutical company in Ireland. Do you understand pharmaceutical? Pharmaceutical, selling drugs, pharma, pharma, drugs, okay, Medi medicine. So I make some new medicine, and I want to sell the medicine in Brazil or India. But Brazil and India have a history of generic drugs, just copying the drug. Right? Another Indian company or Brazilian company can just copy the drug and sell it. Okay? So what should I do? Should I go to India or should I just license it to an Indian company? License it, right? If I license it to an Indian company, that's their responsibility now. I sell them the know-how, I tell them how to make the drug, right? And I give them my, my trademark. Now they can sell the drug with my trademark, right? Now it's their problem. If somebody copies the drug in India, it's not my problem, it's their problem. They already paid me the license fee, 
in Ireland. I got the license fee, right? So now they have to take the person to court who's been copying them. And they are better able to do that than me. I don't want to travel to India to go to court, right? But the Indian company, they already have lawyers in India, right? They can do that much more easily than me. Planned domestication. Uh, so we can help the government to have some stake in our company. Political bargaining. Bargain with the politicians. If you give me the planning permission, then I promise I will use the local products. Or I promise I will hire only the local staff. Okay? Make some bargaining. Political payoffs we put here because it happens, but it's not something recommended. Political payoffs is bribing the government official, right? Giving them money or giving them gifts or paying for their kids' fees or something like that, right? We shouldn't do that. But that, that happens sometimes. Uh, buying insurance. Adding a risk premium to investments. So this is from the financial point of view. If you study financial management, this is the way they would deal with the risk. Financial manager would say, I'm going to invest, invest in Brazil. Okay? What does Standard & Poor's say is the credit risk for Brazil? Like 5% extra, right? So if I invest in Brazil, I have to expect to make a 5% extra profit to allow for political risk. Okay? So it means that I expect I make Disney World in Brazil, I expect to make $500 million every year, right? So in France, I expect to make $400 million every year. So where should I invest, France or Brazil? $400 million a year in France, $500 million a year in Brazil. Brazil, right? But I didn't think about political risk. Okay? Let's say that political risk in Brazil is uh, 10%. Then it's 50 million. I still invest in, in Brazil, right? But at least I took into account. Let's say political risk in Brazil, Brazil is 25%. Then I'm going to invest in France, even though I make less profit. So I could just do this with finance. I could just make some number, some percentage to sum up the risk, and then I can decide whether it's a good idea to invest there or not, based on, on that financial uh, product. So let's uh, discuss with our partner to review about this political risk. Plan domestication is that we can say to the government that uh, we are going to slowly, the government can own part of our company. So the government can build up their ownership in the company. The government can buy stock in the company. Mm. Government can buy stock in the company. Yes. Yes, governments buy stocks in companies sometimes.
So you picked all the serious ones, right? Yeah. There are less serious ones than that, which are more common, right? Like cyber crime or terrorism or so, right? Uh, next question. Songa uh, hey. How could a company be negatively affected by terrorism? had a terrorist attack, so what kind of companies would be affected? Tourism, mm -hmm. educational, maybe some students traveling to France. Uh, give an example of a politically sensitive product, uh, Yulia. Uh, maybe India, India, because uh, Indiana not like America. Mm. And, uh, I think it's, uh, it depends from country. If some people don't like, for example, America, uh, they have anti-American uh, emotion. Mm. Uh, it will be difficult that any product uh, uh, from, uh, made from America uh, mm. try to So sell. that's like politically sensitive for the country, right? What about the product? Can you think of any product which is politically sensitive? Just the product? Maybe food. What kind of food? Mm, fast food. Fast food? Yes. Okay, maybe some countries they think it's a health risk. Other countries not so sure. Next question. Uh, how are you on Chin? Here. Yes. First one. The relation between government and multinational companies are generally possible with the Okay, so take advantage of a positive relationship with the government, yes. And two is political parties often focus public opinion on their negative aspect on multinational company, true or false? Is that going to lessen your political risk or make it worse? Joint ventures. You make joint ventures, okay. Anything else? 
and then friend domestication. So you can allow the government to own some stock, yes. perhaps in your company. Yes. So let's move on then to economic risks. So economic risks is usually put in the same basket as political risks. So when we have the rating company, they rate economic and political risks together. So that often they're tied, there's some relationship. So these are kind of risks that are put under economic risks, exchange controls. So when I was in China, I couldn't change more than 10,000 US dollars in one year. Every time I changed my dollar, I had to make some ye yellow paper. There was some control. It's not easy to change your currency in China. The Chinese currency is strictly controlled by the government, right? So uh, that's just an example for the tourists, of course, for business. Chinese government wants to make it easier. But some countries may stop you from exchanging the money over and back. Uh, local content laws, so we may have to make some product, part of the product in the country. Import restrictions, so the country might put a restriction on imports of the raw materials. It means that we need to purchase the supplies inside the home country. Tax controls, so we, we tax the companies very high, highly or tax the product of the company, like tariff. Price controls, so for example, pharmaceuticals, food and gasoline. We make some kind of limit on the price or the government says you can't charge more than this. Labour problems, okay. Uh, so, the Eco Economic Intelligence Unit provides a country risk service. This is a country risk report. Mainly they focus on developing and highly indebted countries. Do we need to make a country risk report for Switzerland? Hmm? Maybe, but it's not as important as a country like Venezuela or Malaysia, okay? So mainly we're talking about developing countries. So uh, they, this is how they look at the risk. Political risk, 22%. Economic policy, 28%. Economic structure, 27%. Liquidity, liquidity is talking about uh, money and ability to pay, pay back, 23%. So what do they say is, what do they, Judge, right? So this gives us an idea because this is what they use for judging when they're rating. First of all, they look, does the, is there any war? Is there any social unrest? So if I give you the example of Greece, recently in Greece there was a lot of social unrest, right? People were having a lot of demonstrations and so on, okay? So come, Greece is going to get a lower rating from the EIU than a country like Germany, with, with hardly any social unrest. So there are some companies that will say, where am I going to invest my money? Greece or Germany? Germany. Right? Germany. Why? Because they have a much, Greece has a bad score. The Economic, Economist Intelligence Unit or another rating agency gave Greece a bad score because the people are out demonstrating all the time. So if the people are out demonstrating, they're disrupting the normal work, people can't get to work, okay, they're disrupting the business, and so on. Orderly political transfer, so this is a problem in some countries. When I was living in Ecuador, there was a very disorderly political transfer. Uh, the president tried to appoint his own people as judges. And judges have to be independent from the government. So people said he was trying to be a dictator, right? And his name was Lucio Gutierrez. So people had some demonstration, some people had a demonstration, and some people had a demonstration supporting the president, right? And then basically the leader of the opposition party 
paid money to the police and the army. He made a deal with the army and the police. And the army and the police withdrew their support for Lucio Gutierrez, and they changed their support to the opposition party. So suddenly the opposition party were in power, and they were going to call elections sometime in the future. That is not orderly political transfer, okay? And that is usually what happens in a disorderly military trans political transfer. Somebody pays the military or the police money. We can see that Egypt and some Middle Eastern countries also have this problem, right? Who's going to pay the highest salary to the army? Right? Could be the pre next president. In some Middle Eastern countries, the standard of living of the military is very high. In Ecuador, everybody wants to be in the military because they get a very good salary, they get a very good pension, right? Similar in Egypt. So basically, in, in, in some countries, the military is deciding who's the government, right? So we look at that kind of thing. International disputes. Uh, <clears throat> Change in government or pro-business orientation. So, again we can use the example of Greece. Greece changed from a right side to the left side government. Is Greece going to get a higher score for pro-business pro or a lower score for pro-business? I'm not saying that a right side or a left side government is better. I'm just asking you which, which one is going to have a higher pro-business score? What do you think? The left-sided party or the right-sided party? The right-sided. The left-sided is more pro-business or the right-sided is more pro-business? The uh, right-sided is more pro-business. Right, so usually the right-sided party is a higher pro-business. And especially hard left, they might see them almost as anti-business. It means that they are going to be raising taxes and increase. Mainly we're talking about taxes and regulations. That's what businesses are worried about. Do you understand <coughs> regulation? Yeah. Mm, and taxes. So, a, what, a sort of change in the government like that changes the score. Uh, for example, Ireland almost always has the right of centre government. Ireland's two biggest political parties, both of them are right of centre governments. Okay? So, over the last last 50, 60 years, Ireland has always had a right of centre government. So, foreign companies who look at Ireland, they see, think Ireland is quite pro, pro business company, country. Okay? So, Ireland gets a very high score on this kind of thing. So, a US company that's looking to invest in Europe, they might look at Greece, they might see Greece has a low score for a lot of demonstrations, a low score for not pro business government, right? Then they look at Ireland, no demonstrations, very pro-business government, okay? Where are they going to invest? Okay, of course it depends on other things. Ireland also has an English-speaking population, right? And it's going to depend on the skill of the labour force. But I'm just explaining, this is one of the reasons why companies decide where to invest and where to do business, right? So, if we have stability, government stability, and so on, it can help in this score. Uh, bureaucracy, transparency, corruption, crime. So, for example, the Economic Intelligence Unit, they're going to check the Transparency International that we looked at in the last class, right? And they're going to check the country's score and they're going to include it in the rating. Higher corruption, you're going to get a worse rating, okay? Uh, more, do you understand bureaucracy? Yes, do you like paperwork? No, oh, right. Some countries are quite different. In Ireland, people really hate paperwork. It was, it's a cultural difference between Ireland and Germany, and Ireland and the US, and Ireland and Korea. When I came to Korea, I was quite frustrated by the amount of paperwork things I needed to do, which I didn't have to do in Ireland, right? So, bureaucracy means that you have to do a lot of go to a lot of offices, right? They have a thing called an ease of business ranking. Have you heard of ease of business ranking? Which country in the world is easiest to do business? Uh, we can check here. Uh, it means that, how long does it take you to set up a company? You want to set up a company, 
you have to register the company name. Okay, you have to uh, make an office, register your office, right? You have to do a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy. Uh, how long does it take? In some countries it takes six months. In some countries it takes one week to set up a company, right? Where do you want to do business? The country where it takes six months or the country where it takes one week, right? So you can see ease of doing business here on Google, 2013. So we have, again, we have different rankings. Here's the World Bank. The World Bank makes an ease of doing business ranking, which is uh, <coughs> related to bureaucracy. So we can see 2010 to 2014. Afghanistan, not very easy to do business. 183 ranking. So if we look, uh, we can look at China here. Again, China is 41. That's not too bad, right? Out of 180 countries. Huh? Wrong line? 90. 90. Ah, okay. It's 90. Not that easy to start a business or in China. Uh, we have Korea, Denmark. Where's Denmark? Four. Yeah. Not much paperwork. So Danish people don't like bureaucracy or paperwork, right? A little bit like Ireland. Okay. Uh, we can see uh, Ireland, 13. Uh, where is Korea? Five. Okay, so it's easy. Maybe some part of the paperwork might be more complicated, but it's easy to start a business in Korea. Maybe you have a Bali Bali culture. <laughs> so it means that we already explained about Korea's Bali Bali culture, right? So I like about Korea is I can do things quickly, right? If I go to the I can do something online, it could be finished the next day, right? Uh, what about Russia? Russia is 62, okay? So we can check this, uh, it's business, business friendly regulations. Business friendly regulations and time and bureaucracy, okay? So this is important because if I'm a multinational company, I want to go to a country where it's easier to do business. It costs me less money, takes less time, okay? Those kind of things. So the Economist Intelligence Unit also includes this in their rating. And international disputes, politically motivated violence, that kind of thing, right? Uh, crime. Korea has a very low crime rate. Okay. Economic policy risk, <coughs> monetary policy, inflation. Okay. Uh, if, our, if we go into a country with high inflation, we can have some problems. The wage of the worker will be going up, right? It depends on our imports and exports. We have to balance those kind of things. So normally, countries don't really like inflation. Companies don't like inflation. Financial liberalization. Is the country open country, free market or not? Uh, exchange rate policy. Some countries have different exchange rate regimes. Fiscal policy is the government tax policy. Does the government have a lot of debt or not? Debt to GDP. Trade policy. Korea is going to get a good score for trade policy. They're making a lot of FTAs, right? Exports to GDP is high. Regulatory environment. Restrictions. Policy towards foreign capital. Okay, that kind of thing. Economic structure. So we talked about economic, political and economic policy. What about the structure? Is our economy growing? Okay, how fast is our economy growing? So they give a rating band. The best rating is A. Okay, it's like the university, right? You get A grade. Okay, no economic problems, working government, stable government. Most developed countries or OECD countries are going to be A grade, right? So we are more concerned about the countries which are not so called developed countries, which are more in the B band or C band, right? So they have some economic policies or political structure which could be a cause for concern. 
Political and economic risks need to be watched closely. That's B. C. Have a lot of flux or change in their country. It could be an exciting opportunity for the investors, but we have to be cautious. D. Countries are currently suffering from serious economic or political problems. Reset can't pay back their debt. Right? We have to think very carefully. E. Hyperinflation might be involved in a war. Okay, maybe Iraq or Afghanistan nowadays, right? So, another company is Euromoney. Euromoney use nine variables. They do it. EIU have four variables. These have nine variables. And corruption is one of, of those variables. So they just, they just judge it a little bit differently. Okay? So, uh, we are going to check about this. We don't have the internet now, but in the next class we'll be using the uh, computer room. So we'll uh, check. If you want, before the class, you can look at these kind of uh, websites, the EIU and uh, the CIA. CIA has a world Factbook, right, and country notebook. And we're going to try and find this information in the next class, right? Just to get an idea of some of the uh, <coughs> economic and political ideas. And then in the class, we're going to make a report on the political and economic risk based on the EIU data, right? So we're going to choose an emerging economy, developing country, and we will make a report on this emerging economy. Okay? So if you like, uh, you can decide, uh, we'll do this together with a partner, you can decide what country you're going to choose, and you can start to look at that before the class. We have, this is uh, the link of the EIU, you can use the CI fact, you can use any information you want, right? Here you need to register to access the information, so you need to register, it just takes a couple of minutes. Okay, so it's a good idea if you look at it before the class. You can already register, so you have your username and password before the class uh, begins, right? So, do you have any question about the political or economic environment? No? What is the meaning of, what is the meaning of FX? FX is foreign FX. exchange. So I went through this a little bit quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so FX will be scarce. So in some countries, uh, it's hard to do the foreign exchange. Often they use a black market. Yeah. They use black market sometimes for the foreign exchange because they're not allowed to change the money legally. Mm -hmm. Right? That's in the exaggerated case. <clears throat> So, also we can think about this, as we're going through this, remember that for your final uh, assignment, you will be studying one country and one product. So it's a good idea, for example, if you decide early what country, I think it's a good idea, what country you're going to do, then you could be doing this kind of thing, this kind of exercise in the class, on the same country. Then it's easier at the end when you're doing your assignment to write about the political and economic risk in that country because you already made a, you already made an analysis here. So it, actually, so for that reason, it doesn't have to be a developing country, right? It can be any country you want. But the sooner you tell me the country you want to use for your final assignment, the better because each group should use a different country, right? So you should find a, a group for your final assignment of three, three students, right? and each group should have at least one Korean or one foreign student, right? And then if you decide, at least decide the country, even if you don't decide the product, then you can be doing this, this kind of task, then it will help you later, right? So then, uh, any more questions? No? Okay, then let's finish there for today. Thank you.